You guys all uh, ready for a workshop? <laughs> Woo, all right. <laughs> well, let's give a uh, warm welcome to our next presenter, Tony Roman with Cacti. Thank you. Um, today's essentially a workshop. Uh, Larry's covered some of the stuff if you were in the other Cacti presentation, so I'm kind of going to go through that. But basically, today we're covering um, implementations in large uh, installations. So most of you probably know, but uh, today we're going to cover what is Cacti, the origins of Cacti, large installation considerations, automation, the current state of Cacti, the future of cacti, and then we'll have a question and answer at the end. What is cacti? Cacti is the complete front end for RRD tool. Um, I assume that everybody in here is pretty much familiar with RRD tool and what uh, its capabilities are, so we'll kind of gloss over that. <laughs> it's written in PHP and has an optional C-based puller called Spine. We store all necessary information for creating graphs and gathering data in a MySQL database. Has full support for SNMP and ability to use custom scripts for gathering data. So you can pretty much gather anything you want, similar to Nagios and the concept of plugins. And we have a very large user community that uh, has created <laughs> pretty much a template for anything you can conceivably think of. It is probably out there. If it's not out there, you can make it. Origins of Cacti. So Cacti was started in uh, 2001 by Ian Barry as kind of a high school project. He worked for a local ISP uh, at the time called PANet, and he developed it for PANet and put it out there as open source. Um, it's a free application that's published on the RRD tool website, and that's pretty much how a lot of people really have found it. Um, one of Larry's lines, discovered by many in search for replacement for pretty much you name it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, before 2004, Ian released a few releases. Uh, uh, Larry, what was it? Six releases? Not many. It wasn't that many before 2004, but it was a pretty active project. And widespread global use began after the 086 release in the summer of 2004 when uh, myself and Larry joined the team. So, large installations. There's a lot of considerations to be had when it comes to large installations. And first, is the hardware. Um, <laughs> I, I can't say it enough, and a lot of people may disagree with me, but the more hardware you throw at it, usually the better off you are. <laughs> There's always budget and costs involved, of course. So when it comes to CPU, the more the better. The more cores you've got, the more parallel you can do. It really depends on the number of devices and data sources being pulled. Now, in Cacti, there's this concept of a data source. A device has multiple data sources, and each data source basically comes down to, um, for example, if you're pulling a switch, a data source is every metric that you pull on a port. So the traffic in and out is a data source, and the errors is a data source, the discards, an example of errors, uh, Unicast, multicast, those type of things are all considered data sources. So the number of data sources depends on how many metrics you're graphing per devices. And it depends on your network. If you're just doing networking equipment, it can be rather high. If you're just doing servers, it can be rather low. The more concurrency, the better. And the reason for that is there's a lot of processes going on in Cacti. Not only is there the polling aspects for gathering the data, but there's the graph generation and the web serving, as well as the database that is involved in that as well. Other considerations, memory. Excuse me, I need to get a drink. <laughs> Again, the more the better. There's lots of considerations with memory. And one that um, I don't think most people think about is if you increase the amount of memory on the host, consequently you'll increase the disk cache. And one of the major issues with RD is that it's very intensive on disk I.O. And if you increase your read-write cache in the operating system, the operating system is going to help you because it's going to cache those uh, reads and those writes and then sequentially write out the data to disk, giving you a better disk I.O. You can also need more memory allocated in MySQL, depending on how much you're doing and some other things we'll talk about later, like um, potentially moving uh, your polar table into a memory hash table, which can greatly increase your performance. 
Disk.io. I cannot stress Disk.io, 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 Disk.io. <laughs> Anybody who does anything with Disk, Disk.io is your major issue. Um, the process of actually updating the RDs is pretty intensive. Um, RD is relatively good about doing in place sequential writes to the files, but it is still a lot of information to be written to disk at once. And the way Cacti's Polar works, if anybody's you know, familiar with it, typical polar cycle is five minutes. So all your data gets gathered, and then it systematically starts writing out the data to the RD files as soon as it can. During that time, if uh, you're not using some other technology that we're going to talk about, uh, your machine can come literally under-responsive because of the amount of disk I.O. that's being, being pushed. Um, again, more CPU, more memory. The more I.O. operations per second, the better. Again, you can increase your memory to increase your disk cache, which will help. <laughs> My phone is ringing. <laughs> Uh, you can also increase the number of spindles in a RAID configuration. I hope that everybody's familiar with RAID, but the more spindles you throw it at, the more disk I.O. you can typically get. Um, your best configuration, of course, is RAID 10, um, mostly because you're looking at re uh, sorry, writes as your primary issue for RD. Fiber channel um, and storage or SAN, you know, storage area networks with appropriate RAID level configuration are also um, very helpful. As long as your SAN's not over provisioned, you know, and I think anybody who deals with a SAN can understand those aspects. Uh, solid, date, uh, solid state drives, excuse me, and Fusion I/O, um, PCI Express non-volatile memory storage solutions are a good alternative. Uh, you can also supplement those with, um, like, a RAM drive, for example, if you have enough RAM on the host. And uh, I've had a few large installation customers do things like uh, write the, the RDs to either Fusion I.O. device, which is very fast. Uh, if anybody's familiar with them, it's basically a PCI Express solid-state hard drive. It does not use SATA. It's right off the bus, so disk operations per second. Um, Larry, you have one customer utilizing it. It's like 300,000... 300,000 uh, 300, per second. Yeah, it's astonishingly fast, but it's also expensive. <laughs> Um, the solid state drives are also a good choice too, but you have to be aware that you are going to be re reading and writing data a lot, and the mean time to failure on solid state can be a concern for the amount of cycles you're going to be writing. Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, examples of disk IO success. Uh, we had one person we were, uh, Larry and I, were working with that uh, they were unable to complete their polling cycle five-minute polling cycle, 160,000 data sources in five minutes, to completing it less than a minute when using a Fusion I.O. That's alone, just investing in a Fusion I.O. card and storing the RD tool files on there. Uh, and there we go, and a Fusion I.O. speed, write speeds of uh, 3.2 gigabytes per second. That's pretty amazing. I've, I haven't seen SANS go that fast. <laughs> so other considerations is service separation. Cacti has some major components. And those components are the web interface, which is PHP, uh, Apache, or Nginx, or whatever your choice is to make PHP work. Uh, there's many, many, many different ones. The polling and RD storage typically are put together in the database. Any of these services can be split over to uh, another server. So you could split up your web interface on its own server, as well as your polling and your RD storage and your database. The web interface does need access to RD tool files because it's got to generate the graphs that our customers or your users are looking at. So typically you can either uh, utilize SIFs or NFS, some sort of network file system to access those files. Uh, you can use a shared LUN on a SAND. There's many options there. Replication, you can copy them. It depends on what your uh, need for update is if you decide to do replication. And then one thing I'm not familiar with but uh, I know exists out there is disk SAN shared volumes and or file system type replication stuff that you can utilize. Uh, MySQL optimizations are pretty important when it comes to the polling cycle. And the reason for that, and we'll, we'll get into it, is that um, the polar, when it's running, 
basically gathers the data and stores it in a table called the polar output table. And the reason I mention it specifically is we're going to be talking about it um, shortly. And it stores all the data in there. And as data is coming in, there's another process as part of the polar that's reading data out of that table and writing it to the RRD tool files. So that table becomes very high churn, and uh, you need to optimize MySQL to be able to handle the churn and or, and we'll discuss, moving into memory hash table. But that has other issues. Um, my, uh, sorry, MyASM versus IDODB is very important. MyASM has great for small installations. I'm saying it wrong. I know BDB has row level locking, unlike my asthma that has uh, table level locking. So in I know DB world, you get a lot more concurrency. But there's some other concerns, and I strongly suggest you read, uh, there's a MySQL guide on which database engines select for your application. Um, I know DB is also transaction safe, meaning that data integrity is maintained throughout the entire query operation. So it's... Um, a lot better at recovery because it essentially has a journal like a journal file system and more advanced databases, whereas MyASMA is uh, pretty much lock, write, and when you have a recovery situation on a large database, it's literally reading in the whole file again and checking everything and looking at it completely, and your startup time will be rather large. Yeah. <clears throat> Other optimizations you make is an increased MySQL memory usage for caching and sorting. Um, from the standpoint of caching and sorting, it really helps for the polar table, but also helps from an aspect of the user interface and um, the queries that are required to display, like, example, the graph tree and the graph, uh, to pull the graph definitions to generate the graphs. <coughs> Memory hash tables, again, related to the polar. Best for the polar output table in Cacti. It uses system memory, which is much faster than disk. It minimizes your I.O. operations used by the database during polling, because you have competing I.O. going on there between the database and the RRD tool updates. And if you can minimize the competition for disk I.O., you're going to get a lot better performance. Um, an example, on a Cacti installation that I currently manage for uh, the company I work for, Barracuda Networks, uh, we, went, we allocated uh, three gigabytes to the polar output table, memory hash table. So, Basically, we went from a polling time of uh, just a little bit over five minutes, which is detrimental. You're starting to get gaps in your ga graphs and other things like that, cacti, to about a minute at that point when we did that. It's a, it's a great optimization. If you have the system memory to pull it off, you should definitely do it. And also, if the system crashes, you really don't care about that data in that particular table. The next polling cycle is going to pull it in. And it's just a temporary storage location for the pulled data before it's written to the RDs. Important thing, your system must have the very available memory to store the hash table completely in RAM for all the data st sources during a polling cycle. Um, we, do have, we do have a calculation. I did not cover it up here. As I said, uh, contents is erased. But uh, there are considerations, and I believe I cover them. So the, to optimize the polar output table output field, there's a specific field that stores the output from anything that is uh, you query uh, SNMP, scripts, anything. And I think the default size, and I'm pretty sure, is, uh, is a 10,024. But what you can do and to reduce your memory footprint for the hash table is you can adjust the size of that column based upon what you're collecting. There are many um, templates and data sources that fall within that 256. It's very easy to reduce that size of that table. There are some templates, um, in particular, the one that comes to mind is the... Um, older MySQL template and I know DB template that unfortunately has uh, an output length of uh, 3,000 something characters. So you need to change the column size up to 4,096 to actually be able to store that data, which unfortunately bloats the memory hash table up pretty, pretty large. And that's why, for example, on my installation, it's a three gigabyte table. Plug-in architecture. So all this talk about optimization of the base cacti is important, but there's a, a very, very cool plugin that Mr. Mr. Larry Adams wrote called the Boost plugin. We'll get into that. What does it offer? It offers graph image caching. It's pretty important to note 
what Cacti does by default. Cacti goes and calls RRD tool every time a user requests a graph and generates the image at that point, utilizing CPU cycles. Boost caches the image for the length of the polling time on that associated data sources. So essentially, it uh, renders it once and caches it and expires it when the next polling cycle runs so that the new data shows up for the new graph. Also, does on-demand RD tool file updates. What does that mean? And that means that Boost essentially takes that data that's being written in the polar output table and kind of pushes it off to the side. And the RD tool updates do not happen until later. What happens is when a user requests a graph that needs to be rendered, it will then take all the data that's associated with the data sources for that graph and then update the RD for it, generate the graph, and then cache the image. And then there's also a whole bunch of tunable parameters on that, on the uh, essentially RD tool updates that allow you to specify um, how long it'll wait, you know, time frame, or the number of rows in the, the uh, cache table before it'll flush it. And what happens when it flushes it, you can specify how many items it'll process so that you're not flushing, for example, 1.2 million rows of data. You tell it you only want to flush every hour 150,000 rows. So there's a lot of tunable parameters there to optimize it for your system and your load. And it integrates with Spine for direct inserts in the, in the Boost Polar Output table. This is important. The reason I mention this is that Spine can directly write the values it collects, and this is the C-based polar, into the, the essential caching table for Boost. What that does is it reduces some query operations that are happening. So normally in the plugin architecture, when the polling cycle runs, the data gets pushed into the polar output table, and then at the end of the polling cycle, before the RDs start getting updated, it gets pushed over into the boost, uh, essentially boost polar output table, which is the cache place for where Boost stores it. This basically removes that step. The, when you use Spine as a collector, it pushes those data rows into the Boost caching t table, saving that step, saving those CPU cycles, and saving that disk I.O. if you're not using the memory tables. Boost server. This is, uh, I have yet to use it, but I've looked at it extensively. Uh, it essentially is a, a daemon that runs on uh, either on your primary polar box or, for example, another box where you update it, your RRD files. And essentially, Boost will talk to the server, and the server is responsible for updating RRDs and reading RRDs, right? And uh, basically allows us for service separation and uh, <coughs> more optimizations. Because with the Boost server, you can utilize... Um, Additional features in RRD tool and another RRD, another RRD tool utility that allows for um, batch updates to RRD files as one. So it has a lot of optimizations and it helps your load a lot. Uh, again, allows for independent updating of RRD tool files. Uh, you can use, sorry, it's called RRD to update to improve performance. And you can run another, uh, the other, the, another server for separation of services with this process. Automation. <coughs> Excuse me. There is um, a few things in automation. I'm going to quickly cover uh, the command line tools, mostly because I feel in the current version of 087H, uh, which was released on Sunday, we um, lack a lot. But in the next major release, we've got a full suite of tools. So we have a limited support in the current version, primarily adding devices, graph templates, permissions, and users. It's really limited. Future version brings a full set of scripts. <coughs> Excuse me. Creating, deleting, and listing devices. Creating, deleting, and listing graph items. I'm sorry, graph trees. Creating, deleting, and listing permissions, graphs. You know, add, remove, update, and list data queries. Um, and upgrade the database, which if anybody's used Cacti, if you have a large installation, uh, it's kind of a little uh, hairy when you're doing the upgrade and you're waiting for that web browser to just kind of sit there and spin as it's upgrading a database. And you're hoping that nobody else is accessing it at the same time, kicking it off as well. So this, the, in the newer version, a lot of that stuff is, has locks around it, and you can also perform the upgrade via command line, which is very helpful um, and also helpful for the package maintainers in the Unix community. 
plugins, automation plugin, automate. This is written by um, Reinhard Scheck, one of the Cacti developers uh, in Germany, and it's a very cool plugin, uh, automate. It creates graphs automatically when a device is added, either via the command line scripts or the, the uh, uh, add device screen. It will create new tree elements automatically and place uh, devices and graphs on the tree per your rules. All creations activities are based on rules you define that utilize uh, regular expressions and a whole myriad of very customizable, customizable rules. A uh, great example, you can only, you only create 64-bit uh, counter graphs on SNMP2, V2, or higher capable devices. So it's capable of knowing and looking at uh, SNMP host, um, host information, and you can make determinations like it does support V2, and then you can do 64-bit or high-octet counters. Uh, you can also do things like only create graphs for interfaces that are up, and I think vice versa, remove Gra or remove graphs for ones that go down. Um, triggered on graph creation, uh, you know, new devices are added via the CLI. I kind of got out of order here. <laughs> um, and the web interface. Or when um, a re-index of a data query occurs. A data query is, uh, I don't, I just a quick real cover what a data query is. It's, uh, it's essentially, uh, if you're familiar with SNMP tables, uh, like SNMP interfaces, there are things that change on devices that uh, you have an index, and data queries allow for um, getting that information, getting an example, putting the IF alias or the description of the interface on your graph title. Um, when things change in a data query, uh, it will trigger graph creation events so that you can do things like oh, only create graphs when uh, the interface is up. And then uh, another plugin, Discovery. It auto discovers SNMP enabled devices on the network. And it auto creates graphs and can use Automate for this as well. They're both aware of each other. It allows you to select which devices, uh, which discovered devices that you would like to graph. So it kind of gives you a list of things that you can go through and select, and then you can have it auto Automate automatically create the graphs for. <coughs> I must note, too, that we've actually been having some discussions about automate and discovery plugins and uh, I think we've come to the conclusion we're going to merge them because I think as a single tool it would be a lot better instead of having to code, to be honest, code them to work with each other. Uh, the state and future of cacti. So, <laughs> and Larry covered this, we're alive and well. Uh, I hate to report, but we just released, released 087H on Sunday, and the one thing I hate about that is that uh, it almost was a year between minor releases, and that's kind of sad. <laughs> we need to have more, more releases, more fixes, more features. Uh, one of the big things that was in uh, 087H that's really important for large installations is lossless re-indexing of hosts. And uh, what that basically means is that there's this functionality for um, rebuilding the polar cache, if anybody's familiar with Cacti. And this is basically helps do that without taking uh, too long and or disrupting the polling cycle. So you can perform a rebuild without you know, screwing up your polling on a single host. There are lots of polar performance enhancements um, in this release that are very important for large installations. Um, on the installation I work on, when I was testing the beta for this, we went from uh, over 200 seconds to for pull cycle to 47 seconds on average, just from the optimizations to the polar and to the spine pulling. Um, there's a lot more additional template import options uh, concerning RRA definitions. Uh, there's support for the new RRD tool completely. There's improvements to spine performance. And one of those is uh, per host parallelization support and spine. So um, some people have, and, and a lot of and the installation I have has a lot of um, items that are there's one host, but there's uh, 150, 200, 300 data sources. What this does is that spine actually runs multiple threads and allows concurrency at a host level, which is something we really didn't offer before. 
what this does, if, for example, the host can handle it, you can say that it can make 10 connections and start querying and pulling in data more parallel to the host. And I think that's honestly one of the major improvements to Polar that helps reduce the polling time in this version. Future releases of Cacti. Uh, development of the next version. We currently, in August, we uh, actually had a Cacti developers meeting. And uh, one of the things I wanted to make sure we did in the meeting was code. And we did code. We had about 200 plus commits, lots of bug fixes, got pretty far. The next major release of Cacti is going to support internationalization. It's been a major sticky point for a lot of, a lot of people in the international community, um, especially in Asia. Um, we're integrating the plugin architecture. It's so popular. There's so much to it. It uh, makes Cacti so extensible. It's, it's Cacti. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, we are improving the installation and um, being more platform specific. Now, what that means is that when you install Cacti on Windows, and I hope none of you are for high performance reasons, <laughs> it uh, is very Windows centric and installs all the Windows related stuff. When you install it on a Linux or Unix box, it installs all the Unix related templates and things like that. Um, it also puts locking around the installation and upgrade process so that only one person can perform it and not have to worry about that issues. Uh, there's extended RD tool support. So anyone that's familiar with RD tool, we're adding, we finally or will be have added, and it's already in the current code base for the next release. Um, VDEF and um, there was one other one. Do you recall? Yeah. This everything you can think of. I think Holtz Winner stuff, predictive stuff in RD is also in there as well. So there's a lot of stuff that people have been asking for. We're finally getting in there. It was a little bit of an architecture change to make it work. Um, as I covered earlier, lots of command line script enhancements. And what do those give you? Those give you that, that ability to glue it into your, uh, your device management system. Glue it into Nagios. Um, a whole bunch of options there that lets you automate adding devices, graphs, and things like that against the system. And you don't have to use the GUI um, to do it. Um, updated graph presentation, Ajax, I have to mention it because uh, if anybody's used Cacti, the graph tree loads everything at once. Well, we're changing that. It only loads on demand. You click the leaf and it loads the data as you go. It's much faster, much snappier, and much less load on the server and on your browser. And a lot of the interface has been upgraded to Ajax. Lots of callbacks. It's a lot more Web 2.0. It's much snappier, much better, much easier to use. Um, and uh, I don't know if we finished it, but the, the plan for the first for this release is to have the ability to organize the graph tree by dragging and dropping things around, which is a definite plus for anybody who's had to deal with any large graph trees. And a little bit of teaser. This is basically what it currently looks like. I don't like the color scheme. I think it looks like a clown barfed on it, but no, it's all just to be uh, still be worked on. So, questions and answers. Uh, you mentioned the, the boost plugin and uh, the ability for Spine to do direct inserts into the boost polar output table. Yep. Uh, and how that would bypass the, the usual uh, table. Um, is the, the boost polar output table in memory then? You can put it in memory. The it default memory. installation is, is actually um, a local table. Okay. Um, and there's, uh, I think, is there documentation in the boost for how to move it to memory table? I can't recall. Yeah. There is documentation in there how to do that. Okay. Um, you can also, i uh, be honest, you guys can email me if you have questions, too, about how to do it, and uh, I can easily give you advice on it. Cool. I've, I've done it a, a few times, and so has Larry as well. Yeah, there's so. also the forms for those type of questions, too. It's, they're pretty well trolled by us as well. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Do you guys have a rough idea about how many Cacti users you have? That's a really good question, and no. <laughs> <laughs> More than one. More than one. <laughs> Less than seven billion. Yes. A month. 
a million to two million a month. Awesome. Well, the forums get uh, probably about uh, two point four to three million hits a month. It's a pretty active community. Any other uh, questions from the audience? Did I cover it all too fast? <laughs> <laughs> How about another hand for Tony? Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir.